right, good afternoon, everyone. Just a few things to pass along at the top, and then I'll get right to your questions. Secretary Austin was honored to host President Zelensky yesterday at the National Defense University and provide introductory remarks. As Secretary Austin said, America's commitment to supporting Ukraine against Russian aggression is unshakable. He also said that, quote, Ukraine matters profoundly to America's security and to the trajectory of global security in the 21st century. That's why the United States has committed more than $44 billion in security assistance to Ukraine's brave defenders, end quote. The Department of Defense will continue to work closely with our allies and partners worldwide to support Ukraine as it fights for freedom and to meet the clear objective set out by President Biden, a free and sovereign Ukraine that can defend itself today and deter more Russian aggression in the future. The department also continues to stay actively engaged in our objectives related to the current situation in the Middle East region, which are protect U.S. forces and citizens, support Israel's inherent right to defend itself, work closely with Israel to help secure the release of hostages from Hamas, and ensure the crisis doesn't escalate into a broader regional conflict. In support of these objectives, Secretary Austin will travel to the Middle East region next week to meet with leaders in Bahrain, Qatar, and Israel. He also have an opportunity to meet with some of our forces deployed to the region to thank them for their service and for all that they and their loved ones do for our nation. We'll have more details to announce regarding the Secretary's trip in the near future. Shifting to the Indo-Pacific region, Secretary Austin spoke this morning with his Japanese counterpart, Minister of Defense Kihara, to express his thanks and gratitude for Japan's support with search and recovery operations following the recent tragic CV-22 mishap. The two leaders also applauded progress on accelerating U.S.-Japan-Republic of Korea trilateral security cooperation and exchanged views on maritime security in the Middle East. A readout of the discussion has been posted to the DOD website. And finally, I'd like to take a quick moment to recognize one of the department's senior leaders who will be departing next week after three years here in the Pentagon. Dr. Mara Carlin has served in multiple critical roles to include Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, later as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Capabilities, and most recently as performing the duties of Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. During her tenure, Dr. Carlin has managed the writing and ongoing implementation of the National Defense Strategy, a pivotal document in guiding the department, particularly in linking strategy to resources even amid evolving global crises. As she embarks on her next chapter, on behalf of Secretary Austin and all of us here at DOD, we wish her the very best and are confident that her impact on national security will continue to resonate for years to come. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. We'll start with Associated Press. Lee. Thank you. Um, Pat, on the, this new maritime uh, task force effort, can you <coughs> give us an update on where that stands uh, in terms of gathering more countries to participate? How many do you have at this point? Will this include sort of a formal escorting of trips, uh, of ships rather, through the BAM, do you think? And is the U.S. already starting to do that, particularly in light of what happened? Yeah, thanks, Leo. Um, well, first of all, um, we are continuing to take the situation uh, in the Red Sea extremely seriously. There should be no doubt about that. Uh, they, the actions that we've seen from these Houthi forces are destabilizing. They're dangerous uh, and clearly a, a flagrant violation of international law. Uh, and so this is an international problem that requires an international solution. Uh, we do continue to consult closely with our international allies and partners on implementing a maritime task force. Uh, I don't have any specific announcements to make today, and, and we will have more to provide in the near future. Um, but as you highlight, we do continue to patrol the international waterways throughout the region uh, to support freedom of navigation and efforts to ensure uh, safety, security, and stability. Uh, the only other thing I'd say on that, uh, as we've demonstrated in the past, is that our military will not hesitate to take action where we deem it necessary and appropriate including to protect against actions in the maritime domain that could threaten our forces. Well, uh, just as a follow-up, is the U.S. providing ships as escorts at this point? Are companies requesting that? Uh, I'm not aware of any specific companies requesting, but as you know, uh, as evidenced last night, uh, our, our ships will respond to distress calls uh, and, and certainly will continue to work with our allies and partners in the region uh, to, again, support freedom of navigation and security and stability in the region. Okay, Jennifer. 
Um, can you give us more details of what the U.S. did to help the Norwegian ship um, and what was done by the U.S. military and the French military? Uh, sure. Uh, just in terms of background, as I understand it, uh, yesterday uh, around 4 p.m. Eastern time or midnight Yemen time, uh, the motor vessel Strinda, which is a Norwegian flagged vessel, was attacked while passing through the Bab El Mandeb uh, by what appears to be an anti-ship cruise missile launched from a Houthi-controlled area of Yemen. Uh, they reported a fire on board. Uh, we're not aware of any casualties. Uh, at the time of the, of the uh, attack, there were no U.S. ships in the vicinity, uh, but the USS Mason did respond to Strinda's mayday call. Uh, at the time, it was approximately 90 nautical miles away uh, when the attack occurred. Uh, the Mason was prepared to render assistance. Uh, ultimately, though, it was determined that it was not required. Uh, but the Mason did remain in the vicinity of the ship and the area to provide presence in order to deter any further aggression from Houthi territory. And what about the French ship? How close was it to? Uh, I'd have to refer you to the, the French. I just don't have those okay, details. Okay, just lastly, yesterday, um, the renewal of the 702 um, uh, FISA legislation hit a snag on Capitol Hill. What would be the impact on the U.S. military and intelligence gathering if 702 does not pass by the end of the year? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Um, well, you know, just for context, I think that um, Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, uh, Ron Moultrie, really said it best in his recent op-ed on this topic, and, and that is intelligence save, saves lives. Uh, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, uh, allows us to collect vital intelligence, uh, importantly under federal court supervision uh, of non-U.S. persons who are located abroad who, US, who use U.S. communication services and whose communications are assessed by our intelligence community to have foreign intelligence value. Every single day, uh, the, that capability, that authorization enables intelligence reports, uh, which contributes to protecting U.S. service members, uh, and enabling mission success. If that were to lapse, if Section 702 were to lapse, uh, it would really undermine our ability to address complex challenges, managing competition while avoiding and preventing complex, uh, conflict. Our ability to work with allies and partners, for example, uh, to support Ukraine's defense would be downgraded. Uh, our service members would be at greater risk uh, and our country will be more vulnerable of our due to our inability to determine or assess emerging threats. Uh, so this is why we really need Congress to swiftly reauthorize a vital intelligence collection law, this vital intelligence collection law, before it expires this month. Thank you very much. Megan. Uh, can we get an update on the attacks on U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria um, and the injuries that have come from those? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, new injuries at this time. Uh, right now, um, I am tracking a total of, let's see here, we're tracking uh, approximately eight and 89 attacks at this time. Uh, again, you know, we'll, we'll keep you updated on that. Um, again, just to underscore uh, and not to, to mitigate the dangers at, at, by any stretch here, these are dangerous attacks, um, but they have largely been unsuccessful. Uh, and again, I'm not going to get into telegraphing or, or speculating on any response. Uh, but again, we will do what we need to do to protect our forces. When was the most recent? Today, yesterday, and how many? Uh, I, we'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. Thanks very much. What's that? Yeah, let me let me go here first. I'll sure. come back to you. Carl? Thanks. Um, BYU had a journalist embedded with some soldiers in Syria as they went on their first patrol uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, the first patrol since October 7th, since these attacks started. Could you talk about how these Iranian-backed attacks have hindered the counter-ISIS mission in Iraq and Syria since October? Well, as you know, uh, I mean, CENTCOM just put out a release highlighting um, their, their latest statistics on the defeat ISIS mission. So that mission continues, and that's why we have forces in Iraq and Syria right now, and, and we'll continue to stay focused on that mission. Uh, so uh, despite... Uh, these attacks, which as we've talked about before, are not, it's not the first time uh, these Iranian proxies have done these types of activities, we continue to stay focused on that mission. Uh, certainly, if our forces are put into danger, 
uh, we will take appropriate action to protect them, but it's not going to deter us from doing what we're there in the, to do in the first place, which is uh, ensure the, that the lasting defeat of ISIS. And can I follow up on something separate? So Pakistan's army chief, uh, their new army chief is going to be visiting the Pentagon tomorrow for the first time. Can you tell us a little bit about what Secretary Austin is looking for during this meeting? Will they be talking about the deportation of Afghans from Pakistan or potentially um, buying munitions to go to Ukraine? Just any details you could provide. Yeah, thanks, Carl. I don't have any meetings to read out from the podium. Uh, certainly, as you know, uh, when the secretary uh, meets with foreign counterparts and leaders, uh, we provide a readout. So uh, if we have a readout to put out, we'll certainly do that. Let me go to the How other side of the assess, room here. Last question. How would you assess U.S.-Pakistan military relations at this point? Uh, Pakistan continues to be an important partner in the region. Uh, and so obviously through CENTCOM, uh, we continue to stay in close contact with them, uh, particularly when it comes to issues like counterterrorism. Thank you. Nancy. Thanks. Um, I had two questions for you. Um, last week we had asked for the number of sorties that on average the um, Ford and Ike have um, conducted since um, they've gone to the Israeli border. And on average it was, I think it was about 50 sorties a day, which is pretty regular for um, an aircraft carrier. So given that there doesn't seem to be any indication that they're sort of having to do um, an notable amount more of sorties. Can, can you give us a sense of why there continues to be a need for two carriers and if we'll get any sense of or any timeline for when um, we'll hear whether the Ford will be extended again or not? Yeah, thanks Nancy. So I, I'm not going to get into um, deployment timelines or, or potential future ops and, and things like that. Um, in terms of why those carriers are there, uh, a, as you know, as I highlighted in my opener, uh, part of this is uh, working to deter the spread of a potential regional conflict. Uh, in, in other words, supporting our deterrence efforts in the region. And so in addition to the two carrier strike groups, we also sent additional aircraft into the region as well as air defense capabilities, all of which are intended to, one, protect our forces, but two, provide us with uh, options should we need to respond to a wide variety of contingencies. And so certainly air power uh, being a, an incredibly flexible uh, capability provides you with the kinds of assets you might need to respond to, again, a full spectrum of, of contingencies. Um, but again, right now, uh, those, those forces are there to support our, our regional deterrence efforts uh, and send a clear message uh, that we do not want to see this brought into a wider conflict. And then on a separate topic, on Monday, the French Minister of the Armed Forces said a frigate came under direct attack from two drones launched from Yemen. Um, the U.S. has interdicted way more drones since that, but has made the assessment that U.S. ships aren't being targeted. Can you help me understand how the U.S. has made the de determination and why it seems that the French um, have been more assertive in seeing these as a direct attack where the U.S. has not? Well, I think, again, part of this has to do with um, the situation and and why you're responding and so if a drone for example you know i think it was a week or two ago um, you had the the situation where three commercial vessels were under attack uh, and the uh, u.s had sent a ship to respond i believe it was the carney uh, and so as those drones are heading towards the carney it's not clear whether it's heading toward a commercial ship whether it's heading towards the carney but the bottom line it's within the threat ring where that commander has to make a determination. So that drone will be taken down in self-defense. Um, what you don't want to do is let it hit you and then say, oh yes, I guess they were trying to attack us. So uh, again, we're going to be circumspect in that when we say we don't know if it was the intended target, but we do know that it presented a potential threat and we're going to take appropriate action. I guess what I don't understand is earlier the U.S. assessment was that you didn't believe that the um, m military vessels were being targeted. So. I guess that's why I'm a little confused because the French seem to be quite certain that they were. I, I mean, I can't speak for the French, and again, I'm relaying to you the, the information that right, we I'm have. Right, I'm just trying to clarify. Is it the U.S. belief that those drones are potentially targeting um, U.S. Uh, car uh, destroyers, uh, the Kearney and others, or is it that you don't know? Well, they clearly present a threat and we're going to take appropriate action in self-defense. The only other thing I'd offer is uh, if you see the, the comments coming out of, um, you know, Houthi spokespeople themselves saying what they're attempting to target here. Uh, and so, again, 
the targeting of any commercial vessels in the region is a, a violation of international law. And again, we'll work with the international community to address these threats going forward. And let me give you some of your colleagues. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I will go back to the Secretary Austin's phone call with the Iraqi Prime Minister. In the phone call, he pointed out two Iraqi militia groups that backed by Iran, Kataib, Hezbollah, and Harakat and Nujaba, that they are responsible for the most of the attacks. How did you get that to that conclusion that these two groups are responsible for the most of the attacks? Section 702. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not going to get into intelligence. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, what we put out speaks for itself. And do you expect the Iraqi government to put accountability to these groups? And does the United States give any support to the Iraqi Prime Minister Sudani to address these threats? Well, I'm, I'm not going to go beyond the readout that we provided, which clearly uh, highlighted the Secretary's conversation with the Prime Minister as it relates to uh, the, the inherent right to protect U.S. forces. And, and look, uh, Iraq is an important partner to the United States. Uh, we're obviously there. Uh, we have a force presence in Iraq at the invitation of the government of Iraq to help their forces as they continue to work for the lasting defeat of ISIS. Uh, and so, again, that will continue to be our focus. But um, we do very much appreciate the Iraqi security forces and the assistance that they have provided uh, when it comes to addressing uh, these threats, and we'll continue to stay in close coordination and communication with the Iraqi government. But at the end of the day, if our forces are threatened, uh, we will not hesitate to take action to ensure that they remain safe. And then the last question, do you believe that you guys are like multi-question yeah. folks <laughs> <Yeah>. today? <laughs> last question, I promise. Uh, do you believe that the Iraqi government could do that? Because since the very beginning of these attacks, you are requesting the Iraqi government to stop these attacks, but it hasn't happened. Uh, again, I'm not going to go beyond what we highlighted in, in our readout. Uh, you know that we've conducted strikes within Iraq when our forces were threatened. Uh, and, and look, our focus there is on the defeat ISIS mission. Uh, you have these groups that are attempting to exploit the situation uh, in uh, the Middle East right now to uh, work towards their broader strategic goal of expelling the United States from Iraq and Syria. Uh, but we do not want to see a return of ISIS. Uh, and we'll continue to work closely with the Iraqi government and others to ensure that doesn't happen. Let me go to Joseph here. And Just on, on that similar topic, in March, I believe, General Carrillo was testifying on the Hill, and he said there had been seven, around 78 attacks on U.S. troops since, uh, I think it was January of 2021, until January of this year. That's, you know, that's two years. And then just from October 17th until today, we have somewhere around 90 attacks. You guys have previous, more or less said that these attacks are not linked to what's going on in Gaza. You've also, you also said at the top the U.S. is trying to contain you know, this, this conflict to Gaza. Is it still the d department's assessment that what's happening in Gaza is not linked to these attacks on U.S. troops? And secondly, I mean, is it the department's assessment that deterrence is, is working when we've seen the number of attacks in, I guess, two months more than what we had seen in two years? Yeah, well, again, our focus, as I outline those objectives, is to prevent the situation, the conflict between Israel and Hamas, from broadening into a, a regional conflict. And so, no, we, we don't assess uh, that that has happened. It has been contained to Israel fighting Hamas in Gaza, uh, and that will continue to be a focus. Uh, you know, we've talked about this before the situation in Iraq and Syria, why our forces are there, and the fact that you have Iranian proxy groups uh, who are being encouraged by Iran to, again, exploit this situation uh, to, their, to their advantage uh, in order to meet the strategic aim of expelling U.S. forces from that region, which, again, oh, by the way, are there at the invitation of the government of Iraq. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to continue to stay focused on that mission. We're going to continue to do what we need to do to protect our forces. Uh, and, and I'll just leave it at that. Just secondly, if I can follow up on the uh, task force that's being discussed, and we don't have anything to read out, but we, we reported earlier today that there's uh, the U.S. is in talk with 12 nations about this, this task force. Can you confirm that? And then also, can you elaborate at all on the Secretary's uh, conversations next week on his trip? Does he plan to ask at least Qatar and Bahrain to, to join that? Yeah, thanks, Joseph. So so right now, no. Again, I have more, fu uh, more information in the near future as it relates to our efforts to, to work multilaterally uh, in terms of the Red Sea region. 
Uh, and as far as the trip goes, again, we'll have more information in the future. All right, let me go back over to here. Laura. Thank you. Um, last month, uh, President Biden and President Xi promised that they would resume military communications. I'm wondering if um, you could tell us when that's going to happen. Um, so I don't have any specific calls or meetings to announce right now. Um, we have been working closely uh, with our defense attache office uh, and, and our policy team's been in active coordination uh, with Beijing uh, in order to uh, arrange communication. Uh, but again, nothing to announce at this point in time. We have underscored many times the importance of ensuring that that uh, senior, le senior leader level communication continues to mitigate potential risk and prevent uh, right. miscalculation. And so we'll continue to stay very focused and on yeah, that. I know that Secretary Austin doesn't have a Chinese counterpart right now. Have they offered someone to speak in his place? Uh, again, right now we're reaching out. Uh, don't have anything to announce at this time. So thank, thank you very much, Jane. Thank you, General. Uh, congratulations on your promotion. Thank you. <laughs> Getting to start. The 2024 National Defense Authorization Act says that the U.S. troops stationed in South Korea will be uh, maintained at the current level. Does this include uh, troops deployed for joint exercise? Thanks, Jenny. So uh, as you know, right now, uh, we have approximately 28,500 U.S. forces assigned in the Republic of Korea. Um, in terms of forces coming in for exercises, uh, that, that is a variable number that depends on the size of the exercise, the, the number of requirements and things like that. So that, that won't change. So the bottom line is, you know, when it says force levels will be preserved, I take that at, at face value. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about pending legislation. Um, but, you know, exercise numbers can fluctuate, again, just depending on the requirement. One more quick, uh, Ukraine. Uh, do you think uh, military cooperation between North Korea and Russia will lead Putin's war in Ukraine to victory? You're asking. <laughs> Look, Janie, um, you know, what we are singularly focused on working with the international community to ensure that Ukraine has what it needs to be successful on the battlefield, both in the short term and in the long term in terms of uh, deterring future aggression from Russia. So I'll just leave it at that. Ro. Okay, thank you. I have two questions on the Secretary's calls with the Japanese Defense Minister. First, on the Osprey crash, I wonder if the Secretary shared the progress on the investigation into the crash with the Japanese Defense Minister because Pentagon said the investigation will be transparent. Yeah, again, I'm not going to have anything to provide beyond what's in the readout. Uh, as you highlight, broadly speaking, yes, the Department of Defense will continue to work closely uh, with our Japanese allies to share information uh, as it relates to the investigation, you know, and as appropriate. Yeah, secondly, the Secretary also discussed maritime security in Red Sea. So uh, does the Pentagon hope that the Indo-Pacific countries including Japan, will join a maritime, uh, maritime <coughs> task force in Red Sea because what's going on uh, in this critical waterway matters to the economy in the, in the Pacific region. Well, again, I'm not, I'm not going to speak uh, right now for any individual countries. Uh, as I highlighted, this is an international problem that requires an international solution. solution. So we are engaged uh, with many different nations uh, to discuss this challenge. Uh, and as I mentioned, may have more future uh, in the days ahead. And I better go to the phone or else I'm going to get in trouble here. Uh, let's go to Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you. What evidence does the Defense Department have that if Vladimir Putin wins in Ukraine, that he might target Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, all of which are protected under Article 5 uh, of NATO? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals, uh, but broadly speaking, um, you know, past performance is usually an indicator of future performance. And so we've seen uh, Russia uh, conduct gray zone operations. We know uh, that their goal, uh, which they have uh, failed at, it was to eliminate Ukraine as a nation. 
Uh, and so uh, the concern here is, yes, if Putin were allowed to win, uh, there's that, Russia won't stop. Uh, they, they will move on to other countries uh, and attempt to uh, either invade or destabilize. And so uh, this does put us in a situation uh, where NATO uh, could be threatened uh, and uh, U.S. Uh, re requirements and commitments uh, under Article 5 uh, would be something that we would obviously take very seriously. So, uh, again, this is why Ukraine matters. Uh, it's not just about Ukraine. It's about international security, not only in Europe, but also uh, globally. Thank you. Let me go to Reuters. Phil. Hey, Dries here. Um, two quick questions. Uh, firstly, uh, Israel has said that it will deploy its own warship to the Red Sea. Um, are the U.S. Uh, ships already in the region working with them? And will Israel be uh, part of any um, maritime effort in the region? And, and secondly, um, President Biden earlier today said that Israel is losing support over what he called their indiscriminate Gaza bombing campaign. Does the secretary agree with the president that the bombing by Israel has been indiscriminate? Thanks, Idris. Uh, so I don't I don't have anything to announce uh, regarding Israel. I'd refer you to them to talk about their own operations uh, in in the Red Sea region. Um, and and look, Secretary Austin's comments at Reagan uh, were very clear when it comes to two things. Uh, one, that our support for Israel's inherent right to defend itself is ironclad. And number two, uh, that we will continue to expect Israel to conduct its operations in accordance with the law of armed conflict, highlighting uh, that not only does uh, Israel have a moral obligation to protect civilians, but it's also a strategic imperative. Thank you. Come back in the room for a few more here. Matt. Thanks, Pat. Um, today, Reuters reported that a declassified U.S. intelligence report determined that Russia has lost some 315,000 uh, troops either to injury or, or death, uh, total casualties, and also that its losses in personnel and vehicles has set its military modernization efforts back by some 18 years. Are you able to confirm any parts of that report, or do you have your own estimates for, for casualties on either side of the conflict? Yeah, thanks, Matt. I, I don't. Uh, I don't have anything to provide on, on those reports, uh, nor do I have numbers to provide on, on casualties. Uh, but I will take it as an opportunity to highlight uh, the fact, again, uh, the strategic failure of Russia when it comes to the objectives that it had set for itself in Ukraine uh, and, the, and the fact that it has cost thousands and thousands of lives on both sides needlessly. Uh, which is why, again, we will continue to work very closely with Ukraine to ensure that they have what they need to defend their people uh, and protect their sovereign territory. Uh, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Dan. Uh, thanks, General. I uh, wanted to follow up on the, uh, the individuals uh, that appeared to be responsible for the hijacking some days ago that you said appeared to be Somali. Uh, can you give us an update on where they are, if they're still detained or underway with the U.S. Navy, uh, if you've clarified where they're from, uh, and just where they are now? Sure. Uh, they are Somali. Uh, they are still aboard the USS Mason uh, while we continue to work uh, with the Department of Justice on next steps. So as, as we have more information to provide, we will, we will do that. Do you believe them to be working in any kind of way with the Houthis, or was this just a coincidence at a time when there's a lot of Houthi operations? Yeah, I, I don't have any further information to pass along, Dan, and as we get updates, we'll be sure to pass them along. All right. Yes, sir. I'll get one second. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. You just said that Secretary Austin made it clear that the United States is expecting Israel uh, to be careful in its bombing campaign in Gaza when it comes to civilian casualties. Uh, what if the Netanyahu government or the, or the IDF continue to indiscriminately attack civilians in Gaza and continue to use the white phosphorus like it did in southern Lebanon? What steps will the United States government will take? Again, look, we have been very clear with our Israeli partners uh, that uh, we have the expectation that they will conduct uh, their operations in accordance with the law of armed conflict. Uh, it is the, the um, importance of taking civilian safety into account has come up in every single conversation that Secretary Austin has had with his counterpart, uh, and that continues to happen at, at multiple levels. Uh, and, and again, look, we understand that 
Israel uh, is fighting to defend its people from a terrorist threat uh, in the form of Hamas that brutally attacked the people of Israel on October 7th. Uh, we also understand that they are in an extremely difficult fight and an extremely dense urban terrain where the enemy has intertwined themselves among the civilian population and are using them as human shields. Uh, so again, we, we understand that and we will continue to support Israel in their efforts to defend their people and defend their country. Um, but we will also continue to talk to them about the importance of mitigating civilian casualties and the importance of ensuring that civilian aid uh, is provided to the people of uh, Gaza. Let me go back to the phone here and then we'll do one more in the room. Heather from USNI. Thanks so much. Just to follow up on Nancy's question, um, because the French are saying that they were attacked and they are a NATO ally, what responsibility is that put on the United States um, to help protect French military ships that might be getting attacked or other military ships that may consider um, the drones or missiles being shot in the Red Sea to be attacks? Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, so, you know, my understanding is is operations in the Red Sea, it's not a, a NATO operation per se. Clearly, F France is a close ally. Uh, and should they ask for our support or call on us to support them, um, you know, we will obviously respond uh, and, and be there to help. But again, it's it's not a NATO mission, uh, as I understand it, going on right now uh, with, within the Red Sea. Um, you've got the uh, combined... Um, maritime force uh, that that has over 39 nations uh, that that work together uh, on a multi uh, uh, multiple number of um, efforts to sec uh, provide security and regional stability to include uh, Red Sea uh, navigation so again nothing to announce on that front more to follow in the near future uh, but uh, let's leave it there all right sir you get the last question Thank you. Uh as far as U.S.-India military-to-military relations are concerned, how would you highlight 2023 and also any major accomplishment and the what's the future ahead life between the two countries and including yourself if you are enjoying your job or you have enjoyed your job in 2023? I've absolutely enjoyed my job in 2023 and I enjoy spending time with, with all of you here. Um, but uh, in terms of the relationship between uh, the United States and India, uh, you know, with obvious focus on the Department of Defense, uh, I think it's been a very good year. I think we've made great progress in terms of further bolstering our relationship and our, and our cooperation. Um, you've heard us talk about things like Indus X and working on defense cooperation efforts uh, to include in the industrial base as far as developing things like uh, jet engines in India, working collaborative, collaboratively to produce armored vehicles in India, um, the ability of our ships to go to India, our Navy ships to go to India to be repaired. And so all of this uh, working toward the common vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific region uh, where sovereignty is respected uh, and countries can operate in international airspace, uh, sail the international waterways, uh, freely and without harassment. So again, we'll continue to work uh, closely with our partner India, and we look forward to further progress in 2024. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much.